So we're glad you're all here. And we're just really looking forward to our time of fellowship and gathering around, around the Word. So let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we, we just are so grateful mm -hmm. that we have this nice weather mm -hmm. and that we have this opportunity to gather together this morning in the park. And um, we don't take it lightly, Lord. Mm -hmm. There's been times in history when uh, for churches to gather, they've, they're they risking life and limb. Uh, they have to go into hiding. They have to gather in the caves and in the grottos and in the fields far away from, from where people are so that they don't uh, receive the punishment of death mm -hmm. for gathering in your name. And so, Lord, we're just thankful that we can do that here and now. Mm -hmm. And we're thankful for your word. And, Lord, as we look into your word this morning, pray that you would speak to each heart and that you would... Uh, encourage us mm -hmm. and and give us a fresh perspective of, of our Lord Jesus. We mm -hmm. pray this in Jesus name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So we've been in Romans chapter 5. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 5. And our topic for a while has been the accomplishments of Calvary. The accomplishments of Calvary. The, the, the events that have transpired because of the cross. And we've gone through uh, a several things already. And today, we're gonna continue on a thought that we ended up with last week. Last week, we spent most of the time talking about justified by faith, and we, 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 we dug into that more. And today, uh, we're gonna continue this thought because we ended with the phrase, uh, it's in verse, Three, I'm sorry, verse 2, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. So today we're going to explore that more, and we're going to explore another facet of that. So to begin with, we're going to begin reading Romans chapter 5, verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 12, so we can get this into context, and then we'll begin our study. Romans 5, 1 through 12, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. Amen. through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin and so death came upon all men because all have sinned now just a quick glance at romans and if we were to read all the rest of the way through romans 5 we would see something we would see that the word death or a related word the verb form or the noun form, that word is used 11 times in that chapter. 11 times the word death is used. It's referring to, you know, some different things. It's referring to Jesus dying. It's referring to um, us dying. It's referring to the consequences of sin. It's referring to a lot of different things. But the word death is used 11 times. And there are some other related words that relate to death that are also in there. The word condemnation 
is used twice. The word judgment is used once, and then we read in verse 9 the word wrath. So there's these uh, words and this word that all circle around the same concept, this word death. And you're going, dude, Dan, I thought you said we were going to talk about the hope. <laughs> yes, we are. But to understand our hope, we need to understand death. Okay? So we're going to break down the word death for a little while. We're going to look at the origins of death. We're going to look at the consequences of death. And we're going to look at our responses to death and then God's response to death. We need to understand death so we can understand hope. So the origins of death, you need to turn with me over to Genesis chapter two. As you turn there, I'm just gonna share with you the Greek word for death and its meaning, and then we'll look at the Hebrew word for death and its meaning so we can get an idea of just the meaning itself. The Greek form, the verb form for death that's used here in Romans chapter 5 is, uh, I'm not going to pronounce it for you, but it, it's made up of two, two words that are put together, the, the primary word for death and then a preposition, and it means to be separated from. That's really the key ingredient of death. It's separated from. And that's really going to help us in our theological understanding of the word death, but it means to be separated from. It focuses on the idea of separation. Separation from soul and body, separation from God, separation from loved ones, but separation is a key ingredient in the definition of death. The Greek word for death, you're gonna, you, you geeks will get a kick out of this. The Greek word for death is Thanatos or Thanos. Uh huh. You know, the Avengers, right? Yes, the guy that wanted to kill, you know, trillions of people. The Greek word for death is Thanos or Thanatos, okay? Just to let you know. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, we have the word death introduced to us in the story of humanity, and also we have the definition of death laid forth Genesis 2 17 and we're going to read that story in just a minute but I also want to refer to Psalm 23 3 Psalm 23 probably most of you know it by heart if you start thinking about it the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me in the path of righteousness, in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the what? The valley of the shadow of death. So the word shadow of death is one word in Hebrew. It's, it's the idea of coming under the authority of. That word is used many times in the Old Testament. Psalm 91.1 is an example uh, he who abides under the shadow of the Almighty. If you put yourself under the shadow of the Almighty, or sometimes it's called the shadow of his wings, we, we are a dwelling in the shadow of, of his wings. That means we are, have placed ourselves under the authority of God and under the authority and protection of he's hovering over us. So in the context of death, we have been placed under the authority of, or we are walking in death's realm. We are walking in the, in the realm of death where death rules. So even though I walk under the shadow of death, the, the place where death rules, I will fear no evil for he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me. So that's the kind of the Old Testament concept of death. But in Genesis chapter two, death is introduced into the scene. So let's look there. Genesis chapter 2. Now, in chapter 2, we have the, the account, the specific account of the creation of man. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 is an overall view of the, the entire creative process, you know, day 1 to day 6. And then Genesis chapter 2 gets personal about how man was created. Remember, early on in the chapter, it says that 
that uh, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground down by the riverbank and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And Adam became a living soul who was made in the image of God. And Adam was born to not die. Death was not part of the equation on earth at that time. There was no death. There was no decay. There was no destruction. Adam was born to be immortal, to live forever. So he's in it. And then after he created him, it says in verse um, 15. So then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it and to keep it. So now let's read. I'm just going to read it and then we'll talk about it a little bit. OK, this account. Verse 15, then the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord commanded him, the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you can eat. Right? Remember this story. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, who did he tell that to? Adam. Where was Eve? She was not created yet. She was not created yet. Because look at the next verse. Verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So right after that is when Eve uh, came on the scene. And it talks about how the Lord caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And we get that account elsewhere in this narrative. Okay, so then, as this goes on, that's verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. He slept. God took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place, and he fashioned into a woman, uh, he fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and then he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And, and for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. There shall become one flesh. And the man and the woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. And we've talked about that before, really, what that was about. So, and I'm just going to remind you, when it says they were naked and not ashamed, it's not that they were unclothed, but they just weren't clothed with our kind of clothes. They were clothed with the glory of God. The glory that comes from walking in his presence daily, from being in his presence We've seen it throughout the Bible. You know, you, if you're if you're standing before Almighty God in the presence of His glory, and it was really it happened uh, most specifically to Moses. You, you know, he he became somebody they couldn't even look at. He was so bright and glowing, and put a sack over your head, the only part that was exposed, so that it wouldn't scare people to death. So Adam and Eve, constantly in the presence of God, constantly walking with God, were clothed in His glory. That's awesome. They walked with God, they had fellowship with God, they knew him intimately, and they were clothed with his glory. But then the account goes on. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So we have this, this nefarious, this evil one that's introduced into the, into the narrative, introduced in the equation. And we know from other passages of Scripture that indeed this is the great enemy, the enemy of, of all of us. This is Satan himself. This is the great dragon, the snake, the evil one, the father of lies, the destroyer. This is the enemy. And he said to the woman, he said to the woman, indeed, has God said you shall not, it, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? So now there's a dialogue that's begun between the woman and the snake. And we have a we have an idea as we read later in the in this just this dialogue that Adam was also there. And we'll see why he was also there. So Eve began this dialogue with the snake. She says, "Yes, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but but Mr. Snake, let me tell you. Let me tell you that tree that's in the middle of the garden, God said you shall not eat from it 
you shall not even touch it or you will die. So all of a sudden we see the story changing a little bit, right? The directive that came down from God to Adam was, do not eat from the fruit of this tree or you will surely die. Eve says now, we can't eat it, we can't even touch it, or we're going to die. No surely dying, but just we're going to die. So, you know, now I'm going to interject just some thoughts into what's transpiring here. Adam was given the command. Now it's Adam's job to pass it on to Eve and to tell Eve, okay, this is the deal. This is what God said. And as a man, I can see him like, all right, this is what God said. And, and then, you know, a conversation starts and he goes, I, I don't know. You know what? Don't even touch it. Just don't even touch it. And so the word of God was added to. Well, what will what, what happen if I touch it? Well, you're going to die. Okay, so there's a couple things to think about here in this narrative. First off, as the word comes from God to man and then man transfers the word on to someone else, it gets changed a little bit. Never good. That's why when we preach the Word of God, we open up the Word of God, we look at the Word of God, we, we, we say, see it together, and then when the preacher starts preaching, it's all of your job to go, wait, did God really say this? And let me just double check you. And Paul himself commended those who would do that, uh, specifically the Bereans, right? The Bereans were no, more noble than the Thessalonians because they checked the Scripture to see if what I said was really true. So that's the job of all of us who are listening to the preachers. So in this story that's introduced, when Moses transcribed this account uh, a few thousand years later, you know, and wrote the Torah, the word death had a lot of meaning then. But when Adam and God were having a conversation and God says, you're going to die, well, death was nowhere around. Death was a concept that was foreign to Adam. Die. I don't know that he fully understood what it meant. I don't think he did. Because there was no such thing as death. There was no death in the world. There was no death among the plants and animals. No decay, no destruction. He was born to, be, to live forever. His wife was there to live forever. What is death anyway? I don't know that they fully understood it. I don't think they did. So anyway, we get back to the the temptation and the serpent says to the woman you shall not surely die for God knows that in the day you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil so the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise and so she took from its fruit now we are gonna see that yes Adam was there all the, all along she took from the fruit and she took a bite and then she turned and gave it to Adam. And he did the same thing. Then it says, the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made clothes to cover themselves. And that, what I just read, that last phrase is very telling because in Romans 12, uh, 5, verse 12, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that was the last verse that we read out of Romans. It says, for by one man, sin entered into the world. And when sin entered into the world, what followed? Death. So at the moment that Adam took that bite of that fruit, sin entered into the world and death followed right behind. And so we know, we know from here in other passages of Scripture, wherever sin goes, death follows. So when it says that all of a sudden they realize they were naked, that's a signal, that's a sign that something happened. A physical thing happened that made them understand that they were naked. And what is that? Well, remember we talked about that. In the presence of God, you are, you know, the glory of God covering you but because sin entered into the world because they sinned they were no longer in communion and union with God and so the glory departed and they looked at each other and like we're naked what happened everything changed 
everything changed. What was the result of death that day, of death coming into the world? First off, just from what we just said, spiritual death occurred. Remember the word death means separation from? Now they're separated from God. That means spiritual death. What also happened, because what did God say to Adam? On the day that you eat it, you will die. But people go, well, wait a minute, he didn't die yet. Yes, he did. He died spiritually. And the second thing that happened was physical death began. From the moment that he ate, from the moment that Eve ate, they started to die physically. I mean, they still lived another 900 or so years, but physical death began. Their body started to decay, and ultimately they died physically. And then if they were in a state of spiritual death, at the time of physical death, the third death occurred, which is eternal death, eternal separation from God. So we have uh, spiritual death, physical death, and eternal death are the consequences of sin entering into the world. What is our typical response? What is humanity's response to death? Because it says in Romans, death has passed upon all men. And we know that to be true. We cannot avoid it. What their typical response in, our, in the human story is men are looking for a way to conquer death. Men are looking for a way to, to usurp authority over death. Men are looking for a way to cheat death, always, to make a bargain. Men are looking for a way to run from death. Men are looking for a way, and I mean men, women, kids, everybody, to hide from death. That's the typical response. And when we are confronted with death, and, and all of us who have lived any length of time have experienced it, in, in loved ones, when we are confronted with death, we mourn because it's an unnatural thing. Death was not in the equation. It was not meant to be a part of what we are. We mourn. And you can see that even throughout Scripture. It's okay to mourn. And we weep. And we grieve. And we plead, we plead with God, we plead with the doctors, we plead for healing, we plead for more time, we plead for another chance, we plead for all of those things, and yet still, death comes and collects the debt that is owed. Death does not discriminate. Death may come to a baby in the womb, and we're like, well, how, what is, how could this innocent? Yes, the baby's innocent, but there was a lot of sin that, that was introduced into the equation for a baby to be destroyed in the womb. A lot of sin introduced. So death does not discriminate. A baby in the womb might end up paying that debt. A child might end up paying that debt. A strong young man or woman might end up paying that debt. A senior citizen will end up paying that debt. And in the end, no one can say, not yet. Time out. I'm not ready. Give me more time. You can't say that. That's our response to death. That's humanity's response to death. Wait! I'm not ready. And what is God's response to death? What is God's response to death? It said it in Romans chapter 5. At the right time, Paul says it in another place, when the fullness of time had come, God himself got up from his throne, got up from the, and, 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 and left the eternal halls of, of heaven and the glory that was his and emptied himself of his glory because when the right time came God says you're looking for a champion you're looking for someone who can conquer death you're looking for someone who can spare the consequences of sin and save us from death and we've been looking for it 
for all of history. And God says, only I can do this. You can't do it yourself. You can't find a champion on earth that will defeat death for you. I must rise from my throne of glory and I must become a man. And so he did. He became like one of us. And he suffered the humiliation and the anguish of the cross. And he paid the debt that death has to collect. And he paid it for all, not for one, not for 10, not for a million, but for all. His blood was sufficient. The sacrifice of Jesus on the, on the cross is the response Amen. to death. He paid that debt, the debt that death is always going to come collect. He paid it. Jesus defeated death. Write these verses down. We're not going to look at them. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. Jesus triumphed over sin and death. And because Jesus triumphed over sin and death, the next verse that you want to look up later is Romans 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. Because Jesus triumphed over sin and death, it says, we also can triumph over sin and death. And in the end, in the end, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and Revelation 20, 14. In the end, I love this. In the end, the final enemy that is destroyed, the final enemy that's destroyed is death. In the end, the last enemy that's cast into that lake of fire is death. Death is defeated now. The debt is paid now. But death is still here because sin is still here. But sin, the, the power of sin is broken and the debt for death has been paid. So we don't have to suffer eternal separation from God. We still live under physical death but we no longer have to be spiritually dead. We can be reunited with God and with Christ. So we are spiritually alive. So even if we physically die, we will live on and we will, we will gain a resurrected body that will live forever and death will be no more and sickness will be no more and tears will be mo no more and crying will be no more. Therefore, we do not lose heart. 2 Corinthians 4.16, therefore we do not lose heart. And in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, therefore we do not grieve like those who have no hope. We do not grieve like those who have no hope because we have hope. Hope because Jesus himself became the champion that wrestled death and took the sting away and took the fear away and paid the debt and now we can be free from the power of sin and the consequences of sin which is death amen amen so let's uh before we go into our q a let's just uh, let's have a word of prayer and I don't know where everybody's at here, you know, I, I, I think I do. But even so, you know, maybe somebody will be listening to this later. I, I just want whoever's listening to have an opportunity to surrender to Christ so that the debt that you owe, which is death, that you then put yourself under Christ and under his payment for death and you are set free. All right. So so let's just close our eyes and our heads and we're going to just say a, a word of prayer if you do not know whether you are in Christ if you do not know whether or not you have surrendered to Christ and that you have received the pardon for your sin then just pray this simple prayer Lord Jesus I know that I'm a sinner Lord Jesus I know that the consequences of sin is death and I know 
that I live under condemnation and that I live under the shadow of death. But Lord Jesus, I know, I know that you came and became a man and lived a perfect life and that you died on the cross and you broke the power of sin and you broke the power of death and you paid the debt that I owe. And I know, I know because I know that you rose again from the dead. You conquered death. So Lord Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you right now. I want you to be my Lord and I love you and surrender to you in Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right. God bless y'all.